Due to the often cold winters and lack of water, the Yorkshire Wolves have always had less people living on them than other areas of England. This meant that during the old medieval system of strip farming, which were a bit like today's allotments, Large areas of the walls between the few villages were not farmed. They may have had a few sheep grazing, or rabbits kept in warrens, but the land was not tilled or any crops grown. When most of the walls were enclosed into fields in the 18th century, and this waste land began to be farmed. Farmers still kept sheep, but they also grew crops. Men like Sir Christopher Sykes from Sledmere, often referred to as a reformer of the walls, use lots of new farming ideas like rotating crops and growing turnips for sheep to eat. This produced much needed food and wool from land which had not produced food or wool before. The average Wall's Victorian farm was quite large, about 50 acres. This is about the size of 25 football pitches. Some wall farms were much bigger than this. Some even had single fields this size. The main crops grown were cereals like barley, wheat and oats for human consumption, plus clover and turnips to feed sheep. Sheep were the most important livestock and under the new system were fed turnips over winter. This meant they needed less grass, so more crops could be grown. New breeds of sheep were introduced, such as the Leicester Longwolves. These produced more meat and better wool. This was good for the whole country, especially the farmers. They got more money for what they sold. Even today, some Wolves farms still keep a flock of sheep, although they don't always make money when they sell them. Farming in Victorian times was well organised and compared to medieval strip farming, which it replaced, increasingly mechanised. This mechanisation meant using horse and manpower together, rather than just manpower on its own as in the past. Horses were used to pull the machines which tilled the land, like this plough and these harrows and seed drill. Horses were then also used to help harvest the crop. The crop was then threshed later. It was done with a threshing machine, which was usually steam driven. 
The process was very hard work, used lots of men and was very slow. Compare this to what we saw last time, when a combine harvester cut and threshed the crop in one go. One man often managing a hundred acres in one day. This would have taken the Victorian farmers many days or even weeks. Despite this hunger for man and horsepower, the Victorian farms on the Yorkshire Walls were very important in feeding the growing industrial population of Britain. You saw crops like barley and wheat being harvested last time. These crops which produce grains are called cereals. Do you know what these cereal grains are used for? These wheat grains can be used to make flour. Flour is made by grinding the grains between two large stones called millstones. The millstones are hidden inside this box for safety. You can see the grains going in. The flour then comes out and is sieved and separated into four grains. This is the white flour which you may know. But to get that we have to remove all the coarse material. Now the next bag contains what's called middlings which is coarser than the flour. It's more like sand and it doesn't have that same texture at all. And that, that tends to be used for pancakes and things like that. Then we have the um, semolina which is coarse, it's brown and we've got more brown in it and it's coarser still, it's more like sand, very like sand, very coarse. And then next one at the end we have the bran, which is the outer skin of the grain, which is flaky, it's, it's, uh, it's just very loose, coarse flakes of, 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 of the skin of the, of the grain. So that's the bran, semolina, middlings, and that's the white flour, the plain flour. Obviously, if you have a wholemeal flour, then all these are mixed together to make one product. The flour can be used to make bread. The white there, you've got your wholemeal flour there, you've got a little bit of salt there, and you've got your yeast here. I'll put a bit in at a time, it makes it easier really. So just, it's very simple, just mix it in. So once, so now, you just get everything pulled together in a, a lump. Is, you, is this the ball of your hand? That is the bit, and you're basically pushing it away from you and bringing it back towards you. So we'll keep doing this for about six minutes. Now you would keep it in a warm place to make it, make it, everything happen, basically. And we've left this for about an hour and the yeast which makes the bread rise and puts the bubbles in your bread you can just press it now like that and it bounces back so now you know this is ready to go in the oven so we're going to tip it gently onto this tray and you can see it holds its shape and this basket gives it a nice pattern Flour is also used to make cakes and biscuits. 
Some of you may like malted milk biscuits. These get their multi flavour from another cereal grain, barley. Drinks like Horlicks are also flavoured with barley grains, as is another drink. Beer, whose ingredients include malted barley, hops, this is a hop plant, and these are dried hops. Here are the hops being added to the brew. Yeast is the ingredient which makes the mixture ferment and produce this froth. Once the beer has stopped fermenting, it can then be bottled. And enjoyed, in moderation, by your parents, especially your dad. Hello, my name is Tim Laverick. Some of you might have seen me before. On the last programme we showed you how to kill, to cut up a pea. This time we're going to show you how to cut up a lamb. So first off, we're going to cut the legs off. So there we have a pair of legs. Then we're going to cut the front end off. Here is where we count six ribs, one, two, three, four, five, six, and we cut it off at the sixth rib. So there we now have our three primal joints, leg, loin, shoulders. We're going to deal with the legs first. So now we need to split these legs. From this point now, we can take a little bit more of the bone out and we can make some lamb steaks or we can use this for a roasting joint. So we have the fillet end and we have the shank end. And if you want to a shank of lamb, we would cut through the bone there, cut that bone off there and that will become your shank of lamb. Those are the two most expensive pieces of the lamb. So these for mainly for the roasting joints or the steaks. Let's deal with the loin now. This is where we this is either the loin of lamb or the saddle of lamb. Two kidneys in here, which we're going to just take out. We're just going to split this down the middle. So we have the spinal cord, which we want rid of. We'll take the flaps off, flaps, or belly. Which we will either use for a bit of mince lamb, a bit of dice lamb. We'll take the bones out and make some lamb burgers or some lamb coftas. Now we have the line of lamb, which we can just cut to make lamb chops. So that's done with my loin and my legs. Now we have move on to the shoulder. <coughs> Number of things that we can do with this shoulder. We're going to split it down the middle eventually. We're going to take the neck off first. Neck of lamb. We can either make that into some little neck of lamb rings for slow roasting or a bit of soup. Or we can take it off the bone and we use it for a little bit of diced lamb or into the burgers or the minced lamb. Shoulder in half. So we're going to take off a traditional round shoulder of lamb. 
I'm always trying to cut so I keep tight to the bone. I want to take all the meat, as much meat as I can, off the bone. And there we have a knuckle side of shoulder of lamb and a blade side. Right, so here we have it. We've cut our lamb up. We've bone and rolled one of the legs, so there's no bone in that. Mainly for the pub industry, so that's nice to go on a carve, it's easy for them to carve. The other leg I've cut into half, so we've got a shank end and a fillet end. Here is where we can do some lamb steaks, that's for a nice roasting joint. We've cut some of the loin up off the chops to make our lamb chops. A couple of kidneys as we're working along, the most expensive stuff, and then we get more to the cheaper end, the front end. So then we've cut one of the shoulders in half to make a blade side and a knuckle side. This one we were, we were going to bone and roll. And then we have more our manufacturing stuff here which we will either use for mince, dice lamb, burgers, and with the neck of lamb either the same or to make a, a lamb stew or a lamb hot pot. So there is what it, from a lamb that weighed 54 pounds.